Okay, so how is everyone today? Super. Okay, so this is a reminder that in 14 days and like seven hours, we have an exam. Okay, it's on, it's on Monday night. It's at a set time and place. It's not, there's not a window. It's not like the quizzes where you, you take it any time in this specific window. It's that all of us are going to go to an examination room that's not the testing center, and I'll tell you what the room is later. And we're going to go there Monday night at 7 p.m. And that, so my first remark is that isn't that kind of a bummer yeah. <laughs> that we're going to do that? Okay, we're going to do that. Okay. That, that's when the exam is. I can appreciate entirely that that's inconvenient to your social life and whatever else. Mine too. Monday the 17th. Not in the testing center. It'll be in, it'll be in a big, um, an, an enormous lecture hall. And I'll, you're already registered for it. Okay. So, um, as a reminder that we, as far as the written homeworks, the things that you turn in every time you come in, by the end of the semester we'll have like 70 or so of them. And at the end of the semester we'll drop your lowest seven or so of them. Okay, because everybody has some kind of issue that comes up, right? My dog was sick. My dog ate my homework. My dog was sick because he ate my homework. Whatever, whatever it is that came up, okay? We're going to drop, drop seven of them. Okay, now, as for the quizzes, we're not going to drop any quizzes. And the reason why we're not going to drop any quizzes is because of the structure of the exams. So, the exam, which is occurring in two weeks, by the time the 17th comes around, we will have finished quiz six uh, on Saturday the 15th. Uh, <clears throat> so, how the structure of the exam is that there will be on the order of 12 exercises, okay? And they will be in direct correspondence with the quiz questions that you've taken. And they will literally say, this is, this is uh, an analog for, say, quiz three, question two, for example. And you'll have, there'll be 12 of them, and, or so. And from these 12, you'll be able to select six, or so. I haven't decided the numbers. Me and the other instructors will make that decision a little later. Then you take those six and you can improve your quiz grade on those six exercises. Okay? So there's two graded exercise per quiz. There'll be six graded quizzes by the time of the exam. So there'll be 12 such quiz exercises that you can improve upon. So what you need to do between now and then is you need to look at all the quiz exercises that you really think would be good for you to have to, to redo. Okay, and you need to become quite familiar with that exercise because the exam will be your opportunity to remedy whatever bad thing happened, <laughs> say, on quiz three, question two. Either because you just didn't know how to answer it or because you weren't present one way or the other. Yes? It is 7 to 8.15 p.m. Yes? So if we choose a question on the exam that we got correct on the quiz, mm -hmm. would it boost another question on the quiz? Or is it specific to that? It's specific to the question. So the exam replaces the quiz? Uh, so that also has not been, so the question is, I think your question is, supposing that I did not do good on quiz three, question two, but then I do the redo version of it on the exam. How, how is that reckoned from there? We haven't decided that, but probably it's going to be replacement. It's going to be maximum. So if you did, if you did better on the quiz, on quiz three, question two, than you did on the redo, then we'll, we'll keep the better one. That's probably what it's going to be. I don't, I don't guarantee that yet. So it'll be non-penalizing. Okay, but you'll have to make up your own mind as to which six or so you're going to attempt. And then there'll probably be a mandatory part of the exam as well. And our quiz 
scans are online, right? Mm -hmm. They will be. Okay. And, I mean, you haven't taken quiz five or six yet, so they're not. Yeah. But the other ones, yeah. So, as a reminder also, there are PDFs of keys posted online, and there are also videos of me making the PDFs of the keys that are posted online. Okay, so then every... Where are what? The videos? The keys, yeah. <laughs> the keys are posted on this more or less the same place where you download the written homeworks, the same website. Okay. And then the video keys are posted on YouTube. Okay. And there's a link to YouTube on the same place where you download the written homeworks. And just at, yes? Sorry, go ahead. And just as a reminder, the way that course works, okay, is we go over material for a week. Okay, so we're doing new material this week. All next week are the due dates of the homeworks for the material that we're doing this week. So there will be online homeworks and written homeworks over this material due next week. And also, the week after that is a quiz over that same material. So it's all staggered. You learn for a week, you homework for a week, you quiz for a week. So like this week, for example, you're taking a quiz. It was over material that you learned two weeks ago and homeworked one week ago. Because I'm using homework as a verb. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions? Yes? So are we getting in grade as well as improving our quiz grade on the, on the midterm? Yes. Yes. You, you can improve. You, you will definitely be able to improve your quiz. And if there's, if, I'm not sure, but if there are going to be mandatory questions, that will be an <coughs> exam grade. Yeah. This is really a very big opportunity for you to fix your quiz average and to improve your situation. Yes? Okay. Just to clarify, so there's 12 questions. Or so. Quiz, or so, give or take. And we take about six to do, which are like redos of questions from the quiz. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you should look in the grade book okay. and see what happened. And maybe for you, quiz four, question one could stand some improvement. So redo that one on the exam. Well, <coughs> well both. Okay. They should be in direct correspondence to each other. Yeah. <laughs> other questions? Okay. So let's get to it. September is gone. So we're in section 3.1. It's called something like functions. Uh, the first definition is of something called a relation. So a relation is a rule, rule which assigns To every element of a set <coughs> called a domain <coughs> at least one. element of another set called the range. Okay. So there's there's sort of three things in play here. There's two sets, a domain and a range. 
and a rule for how they're the elements in, in the domain are related to elements in the range. So for example, maybe, so this will be the domain. And I'll say things are in the domain are say one, two, smiley face, and triangle. Those are things that are in the domain. This will be the range. And maybe uh, four, one, uh, sad face, <coughs> and square are in the range. <coughs> and maybe, maybe even one other thing, so I'll put a five here. Because it doesn't need to be the same number of things. So now we're going to make a rule. So I'll say that one. One is related to four, and since one is the loneliest number, also the, smi the sad face, right? One, because why not? Okay, so then two, I'll say, is related to square. Um, I'll say triangle is related to, say, square. Sad face and one, and then smiley face is related to five. Okay. So, what's two related to? Uh, square. square. So these arrows represent the rule of how things are associated. Interesting. <clears throat> so another way, so these, these are referred to as, the, as arrows. Besides arrows, you can also have ordered pairs. And what you do is you list out all of the relationships between things. So what is one related to? Four and sad face. Four and sad face. So one is related to four. So that's one pair. What else is one related to? One and sad face. <coughs> sad face. So we'd also need to write one and sad face. Is one related to anything else? Nope, that's all the things. Okay, so two. What's two related to? Square. Square. Is two related to anything else? Nothing else. Okay, how about smiley face? Okay, good. Okay, and how about uh, triangle? What's one of the things it's related to? So yeah, it's related to square. Anything else? Sad face. Anything else? One. Anything else? That's it. So how many arrows are there? Seven. seven, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. How many ordered pairs are there? Seven. seven, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The arrows and the ordered pairs are in direct correspondence. Now, sort of what's kind of neat about the ordered pairs representation anyway is that what if you were to completely forget about this? Then can you tell me the things that are in the domain? <coughs> What's in the domain? One, two, happy face. Right. One, two, 
happy face, and triangle. So is the, is the right answer one, one, two? So if the question is, what's in the domain, is the answer one, one, two, smiley face, triangle, triangle, triangle? Why not? Right. It, in, the domain is a set. So things are either in the set or not. So if one is in the set, there's exactly one one in the set. If smiley face is in the set, there's exactly one smiley face in the set. So there's not multiple things in a set. Multiple copies of the same thing in a set. Okay, good. So any question about this? So th that is to say that now I, I could give you I could give you a relation like this with the arrows, and then I could say, give me the ordered pairs. Or I could, I could give you just the ordered pairs, and, I could, and maybe these two things, and then I say, you draw the arrows. Okay, they're in direct correspondence to each other. Any questions about this? So a function A function is a relation. So I'm going con to continue writing. But in the first place, a function is a relation, which means that fundamentally a function must be a rule that assigns uh, things in the domain to things in the range. Must be just like that. So error, arrows, ordered pairs, etc. With the following restriction, with the restriction that each uh, element in the domain is assigned to exactly one element of the range. So what does that mean? How is that different than a relation? In so a relation, mm -hmm. you can have triangle square and triangle set face and triangle one. Right. But in a function, you can only have the triangle square. <clears throat> right. So the the language difference, the language difference is that a relation assigns to every element in the domain at least one. So that means that with the arrows, that means that at least one arrow has to be leaving everything in the domain. Okay. It also means that for everything in the domain, you have to, <coughs> the, the, the left element of the ordered pair has to appear at least once. So this exactly one means that if when you draw the arrows, there can be, there must be exactly one arrow leaving each thing in the domain not more than one. So, an example. Is this relation a function? Not a function. Why not? There's two arrows in 
two arrows leaving one. So not a function because one is assigned to two uh, different things. Okay, so how about how about this one? So is this a function? Yes, this is a function. Because you can see that for, for in the first place, it is a relation. And then everything in the domain has exactly one arrow leaving it. OK. How about this one? Is this a function? Yes. This is a function. So now as a matter of foreshadowing, I'd like to point something out. But wait a minute. I see that B has two arrows. Are you sure it's a function? I thought it was, I thought it was just one arrow. What is the one arrow requirement? From the domain. One arrow from the domain. That doesn't say anything about one, one, one arrow reaching every point in the range. So now, I want you to imagine that this is some machine. And that you know how it works, but it's very big. And you're standing here on the exit side, the output side. And because it's so big, you can't see the input side. So imagine that you're here, and you know how the machine works on the inside. And suppose that you see an A come out. Do you know what was put in? For this, for this particular function, do you know what, what must have been put in? Three. A three. Because nothing else could have made an A. You input a 3, you output an A. So if an A comes out, it must be the case that a 3 was put in. Okay, how about, what about if you see a B come out? Do you know what was put in? Yeah, it had to be a 1. Nothing else could have made a B. And similarly, if you see a C come out, a 2 must have been put in. So no matter what comes out for this function right here, you, kn you are for sure, you know what was put in. Okay, now imagine the same scenario for this one. That this is some big building and you're standing right here. And you know exactly the way the machine works on the inside. Suppose that an A comes out. Do you know what was put in? Yes. yes. Because only a three could have made an A. Now, suppose a B comes out. Do you know what was put in? For sure. Yeah, it could have been a 1 or a 2. So you don't know for sure which, what was put in. Could have been a 1, could have been a 2. So now, what I want you to think of this, this function, because this is a function and this is a function, and I want you to turn them around in your, in your mind's eye, turn the arrows around. Is this one a function when you turn the arrows around? Yes. 
If you make this the domain and this the range and turn the arrows around, this is a function. Okay? How about this one? This one's not a function. If you make this the domain and that the range and turn the arrows around, this one's not a function. So here's a function that even if you turn it around, it's still a function. But this is a function that when you turn it around, it's not a function anymore. And we're going to, we're going to draw a sharp distinction between these a little later. But conceptually, you can think of it like a machine that you could conceivably run in reverse. That, you know, someone on this side puts a 3 in it, out comes an A, but you could push the A back in, and then on the other side, a 3 would come back out. Right? But if you were to do this, if someone was to put in a 1, and then you saw a B come out, if you tried to push the B back through, the machine wouldn't know what to produce. Should it produce a 1, or should it produce a 2? Okay, good. Any question about this? Okay. <clears throat> So one common way to represent a function is with a drawing. So let's make a drawing. some dots. Hmm. How about this one? Okay, so I drew some dots. Now I'm going to connect the dots. And I'm going to say that this is, this is the plot of y is f of x. So it's a drawing that describes what kind of thing our function that we're going to call f, so we have a function, f. And just a reminder of my stylistic convention is that when I'm writing English prose, I write in caps. But when I'm writing a math quantity, I write it in script. Okay. So I have a question for you. Uh, what do you get? What do you get if you if you put a four into the function? If you plug in four, what will you get? So reading this and comparing it to this expression, what's going to be 4? X. x is 4. So the horizontal axis is x, the vertical y. So this right here is x equal to 4. Oops. That's tape. I can't write on that. Okay, so this is x is 4. And the question is, is are there any y values when x is 4? Yeah, there's this 1 right here. So what is the y value right here? Y is 1. So that means that if you put in x is 1, or sorry, x is 4, I mean to say, then out comes y is 1. Okay, so let's try that again. What if we put in, say, 0? Negative 1, right? Because when x is 0, that's this x value right here. 
And then what's the y value when x is 0? Ah, it's right here. Okay, and that y value is negative 1. How about if we put in, say, we plug in x is 2? Then what? Yeah, then out comes y is 2. So any question about these? So now let's look at it backwards and say let's solve f of x equal to 2. So all of the ones above, all of these were find a y value given an x value. So like this one, when I presented it to you, I was asking, essentially, well, what do you get if you, if you put in x is 4? And we said, oh, you get y is 1. And then I said, what do you get if you put in x is 0? And then we said, ah, oh, you get y is negative 1. So what is this? Yeah, this is I want to know all the x values, but now I've given you y values. So it's, it's the reverse of the problem of the, of the previous one. So this is find x values. given a y value. Or, if you don't like x's and y's, you could say inputs and outputs. You could say that this one is, is find the output when the input is 4. Find the output when the input is 0. Here, the question is, is tell me the, all of the inputs that have output 2. Okay. So what's the answer? That's one of the answers. Are there any other inputs that can give you output? Negative three. Negative 3 can also give you that. So look, if you plug in x is 2, then you get y is 2. Okay. So one of the answers is x is 2. Are there any other x's that you could plug in so that you would get y is 2? Also negative 3, right? Now, another way to consider this exercise is to do the following. is to say, okay, I'm going to take this and I'm going to break the equation into two separate pieces. So one of them is the piece that we were already given. So I'll say y is the left-hand side. This is what we were given. And now I'm going to say y is the right-hand side. So y is 2. So what does the plot of y is 2 look like? Mm -hmm. what, the plot of y is 2 is all of the x values where y is 2. So that means the, that's where x is 0 and y is 2, x is 1 and y is 2, x is million and y is 2, x is pi and y is 2. And if you plot all of those points, that's this line right here. And so, so this is y is 2. And now the question becomes, you were given this green and red thing, and then we just drew the blue thing. Do they intersect anywhere? How many times do they intersect? Twice, here and there. What are the coordinates of this intersection? Mm -hmm. Negative 3, 2. And what are the coordinates of this intersection? 2, 2. 
And those are the, the x values of those intersections is the answer to this question. x is 2. x is negative 3. So solving an equation visually is equivalent to intersecting things, finding where things are touching. Okay, any question about this picture? We have a little more picture stuff to do, but this picture is now too cluttered up, so I need to draw a different one. Any questions about this? Okay. So there's nice, nice function there. And I, I'm purposefully not connecting the middle ones. They're not connected. OK. So again, I'll say that this is the plot of y is f of x. So I could ask, I could say, for example, uh, please tell me, what do you get if you plug in uh, 1? You get 2, right? When you plug in x is 1, the output is y is 2. So <clears throat> the answer is 2. OK. What's another x that we could plug in conceivably? We could plug in 4. Could we plug in, say, uh, 3? Yeah, but because of the way I drew it, it's less clear exactly what the value is. But in principle, we could plug it in, right? And measure, like with a ruler or something. Okay. Can someone tell me an x that you just can't plug in? Negative, negative 2. Okay. So f of negative 2 is not defined. What's another x that you just can't plug in? Zero. Why not? Because I hope you can see there's no, there's no y value corresponding to the x value zero. OK. So now I'm going to ask, what is the name for the set of all x's for which the function is defined? It's domain. So now I'm going to ask. What is the domain of f? Some people are able to just do it like that. But for those of you who need just a little bit more um, guidance, so I'll explain it like this. The strategy is that you sweep a vertical line
left to right. So specifically, so I'm back here at, say, x is negative 10. And this, this is my vertical line. So is, is x equal to negative 10 part of the domain? How can you visually see that it is not part of the domain? There's no intersection, right? My vertical line is not touching any of the plot. So I'm going to start sweeping, and you tell me when, when I've entered the domain. So do, 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 do. Oh, the domain has started, right? And, and at what x value did that start? At negative 5. And is it closed or open at negative 5? Closed, because that's a closed dot. Okay, then we sweep. So, so right here, are we in the domain? Yeah. Why are we in the domain? Right, because you can see my my vertical line is intersecting the green. Okay, so then the domain continues, do 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 do, and then it stops here at negative two, and it's open parentheses because that's an open circle. Okay, and then in here, there's no intersections. No intersections, so this region in here is not part of the domain. That's why the domain stops for a moment. And then, okay, starts, starts, at, four, or starts at one, is closed, continues, stops at four, is closed. And there's no more. So any question about the domain? So what do you think is the next question I'm going to ask? The range. So if the strategy for computing the domain was to sweep a vertical line left to right, what's the strategy for computing the range? Very, very good. So you sweep a horizontal line, bottom to top. So. I know that I thought I heard you say top to bottom. So why did I change it? You're starting with the lowest. Right. Negative to positive, right? So sweep in the increasing direction. Okay. So who wants to give a stab at it? What's the range? The bracket negative two. Yes. Four. Yes. Okay, now, I'm going to, some of you are able to see it just like that, that's fine. Now I'm going to do it sort of carefully and, and ask questions. So down here at negative million, is this part of the range? No, no right? So then I'm going to start, I'm going to start up, start sweeping up and say do, 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 oh, the, the range has begun, okay, at negative two, and it's closed because that's a closed circle. Then I continue sweeping, do, 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 oh, wait a second. I lost the, I lost the range there for a second, right? <coughs> no. Is this, is this y value in the range? Yeah. But that circle's open. But, the, the right side. but that one isn't, right? You just need one. Right, I could, I could arrange so that there'd be millions of open circles. But as long as there's one, it's still part of the range. It's still part of the range. And then do, so, so uninterrupted. Do, 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 do. Okay. What's going to happen here? Nothing, right? Because we're going to go from here. There's presently two intersections. We're going to go to one intersection. Is one, one intersection enough to be in the range? It sure is. So do, 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 do. And then what happens beyond here? Now there's zero intersections. That means we're not in the range anymore. Okay? So that was uninterrupted, right? So zero intersections, not in the range. One intersection, we're in the range. One, 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 one. Still one. We're still in the range. Two, 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 two. Still in the range. 
one, 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 still in the range. Zero, no longer in the range. Any question about this one? Okay. So the most common kind of expression, uh, the most common kind of function that we'll deal with in our class is a function defined by an expression. So this is exactly what it sounds like. So I'll just give you an example. f of x is x squared plus 5. So the function is called f. Its input we're calling x. And the way you, com you produce the output is by computing, by evaluating this expression at that x. So what if you plugged in 2? If you gave it input 2, what would the output be? 9. 9, because that would be 2 squared, which is 4 plus 5 is 9. What if you gave it input 10? The output would be 105. Okay, and when the domain is not explicitly specified, the domain is the natural domain. Natural domain of the expression. So, for example, suppose I give you f of x is x plus 4 divided by x minus 5. And I ask you, what is the domain? So what's the domain of this function? Anything but 5. And if you were requested to do so, you could write this in interval notation as negative infinity to 5, union 5 to infinity. Whereas, suppose I give you this function, g of x is x plus 4 over x minus 5, and I tell you that this is on 10 to 20. So this is an explicitly specified domain. So now I have a question. What is the domain of G? So this one was, what is the domain of F? So what's the domain of G? 10 to 20. <laughs> That's what it is. So now, I know we've got 10 seconds left, so last thing I want you to think about until Wednesday. So what is, what, what do you get if you plug, say, um, <clears throat> 10 into F? What do you get? Fourteen in the numerator, five in the denominator. What do you get if you plug ten into g? Fourteen over five. Uh, five. <laughs> five. Okay, now, last, last thing, I know we're coming to the end. What if you plug in a hundred into f, what do you get? 104 divided by 95. And what about g of 100? This is not defined. 
because it's not in the domain. It's not defined. You can't put 100 into G because G's domain is 10 to 20. Does that mean you can have numbers 10 through 20? Have a nice win uh, whatever day it is, Monday. <laughs>